Welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything we do. Our work starts with education, and if you're not familiar with Care Patrol, we are a placement agency, meaning that we advise people on what's next in their health care journey, how to qualify and pay for that. And we're paid by providers of private pay, community or sitter services for our referrals. But we remain free to your clients, just like this CEU is free to you today. Uh, we've been doing these now for about four years. We've been doing Care Patrol since 2011. Uh, and we've been graced with having many good presenters who've joined us for our CEU series. We have another one today, a returning presenter, Pamela Strickland with Medicaid Application Processing Services. And I know that Pamela and I will both enjoy uh, when you uh, engage with her via the chat room, or if you'd like to unmute, raise your hand, I'll unmute you. If you're new to Zoom and you're not familiar with the chat room, move your cursor to the top of your screen or to the bottom, at some point, a black bar should appear with the word chat on it. Click on there and add your voice to ours, and I know that everyone on the call will be enriched. If you've been with us before, you know that our evaluation is online and it's password protected. We give the password out at the end today, and in doing things this way, the Alabama Board of Social Work agrees that this hour for you social workers is considered a live or classroom hour, just as if we were face to face. Uh, and all of you will receive a certificate who complete our evaluation. Uh, and you must complete the evaluation to receive a certificate. The evaluation closes at eight o'clock tonight and we give the password out at the end today. But for those of you who've been with us who are in your car or at your desk and you know that uh, and you're not able to see the screen, uh, let me read for you or read the chat room. Let me show, uh, read for you the evaluation link for today's session. It is HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www dot surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters and some numbers b as in boy x c as in cat j six seven q that's our evaluation link for today. I've posted it in the chat room for you. Thank you, Ms. Calder, for doing the same. And now, Ms. Strickland, I believe that we've taken care of our housekeeping. We'd love to hear more today about Medicaid questions and answers. Certainly. Thank you for having me, Sean. I love this. I enjoy talking with uh, uh, everyone in the chat room. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask those. Uh, today, I'm doing a special on Medicaid questions. I get this a lot. And um, uh, when social workers call me, they'll ask me these types of questions. And so we'll get started. And um, these are a lot of the questions that I get asked. What, what needs to be done? And so sometimes the income is too high for an individual. Uh, so they're told they cannot apply for Medicaid, which we know is untrue. Um, or they're over-resourced. Uh, as you know, Medicaid claimants can only have uh, $2,000 in resources. And this is considered everything from bank accounts to, to uh, investment accounts. They can have no more than $2,000. This is also including IRAs and 401k funds. Um, I also have been asked several times about what happens when they own rental property. Um, we'll go through that. And then loans given to family and friends. We'll go through that too, so that you'll understand what type of um, problem that is for Medicaid reasons. Um, and then what can we do with the investment accounts? And this includes Schwab, Raymond James, 
Um, anything out there that's investment, you may have a money market account at the bank. These are the types of things of the questions I get. So let's go through these one at a time. Now, when we're talking about uh, steps to Medicaid approval on the income, we know that for 2024, the income cap is 2,829 per month. This is only for the Medicaid claimant. If they're married, the wife or the, or the husband, whoever's not the claimant, they can have their own income, but this is just for the claimant. Most of the time this income is social security, but if they retired, they'll have probably a pension income. Sometimes the, um, <clears throat> the railroad workers, so they'll, they'll have a railroad income instead of the SSA income. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, what happens when they are above uh, the income cap? Well, there's a, a, an account that must set be set up. It's called a Qualified Income Trust or QIT account. This is a bank account. And why don't we set this up? Well, we would set this up at a bank. There's a, an agreement that would need to be done. And then that would be signed and notarized. And then you'll take it to a bank that does qualified income trust or QITs. And um, you would deposit dollar for dollar, cent for cent, the amount of social security income that they get each month into that QIT. And why, why do you do that? Well, that's because once it goes into the QIT, it is no longer considered in the um, preparation for Medicaid. In other words, Medicaid has access to this QIT account and they will tell you what you can spend it on. And that will be the nursing home cost and any supplemental insurance, health insurance can be paid from this account, nothing else. No other income, no other money can deposit be deposited into this account except for income. So let's say I've had before uh, an individual who had um, retirement accounts. They had investment accounts that paid income each month, and they had SSA. They had over four thousand dollars in monthly income. We moved all of those deposits into the QIT, and then you would be required or the um, sponsor for the Medicaid claim, it would be required at that time to contact Social Security and whatever pensions they have, whatever annuities they have that pay an income and have them direct deposit all of this into the QIT account. So you only write that first check and then after that, you should have everything direct deposited into the QIT. This gets them in a place where they're Medicaid qualified for income. Now, uh, once that's done, and we verify that all the income is there, um, we then move to the next issue. They have IRAs. Well, by Medicaid standards, all IRAs must be cashed in. And this includes CDs, if they have certificates of deposits, if they have EE bonds, all those things, they must be cashed in. And then if... Um, those are cashed in, you place them into the normal checking account of the individual, not the QIT. You place them into their banking account. And we'll get to why a few minutes later. Then if let's say that they have an annuity and that annuity pays them a monthly income, she can keep that. And um, that annuity can be one of two places. If it's, uh, if everything else has been moved, into the QIT and this annuity comes in, let's say it's $300 a month, $400 a month, you can keep that going into the regular checking account. Um, and you can keep that as a stream of income so you don't have to cash in that annuity. But what happens if it's not income producing? Well, in that place, you have to cash it in. If this is an annuity out there that's holding money, you have to cash it in and it's placed into the claimant's checking account, regular checking account. Um, now let's stop, excuse me, just a second, turn my heater off. Um, let's, let's look at a moment at what happens when all this money is placed into the normal checking account of the claimant. Well, that money is going to start building up. And then you have an investment account, whether it's Raymond James or a money market or what. You can't keep those, must be cashed in. Those are also placed into the checking account of the claimant. If you have a savings account, money market account, you can't keep it. 
I know that if they're with a credit union, they have to have a checking, I mean, a savings account with $5 in it. You can keep that. But anything else has to be moved into the checking, into the checking account. If it's not a credit union, you have to close that savings account. So all of that has to be placed into one place, and that's that checking account. And we're not talking income. We're talking resources. So once all the IRA and the investments and the savings funds are cashed in, then what? Then we move to take all of that clump of money and we set up an Alabama family trust. And, the, and all investment accounts and savings accounts have been cashed in and placed to the claimant's checking account that money is deposited within Alabama Family Trust. And these funds are then used to increase the quality of care over and above what Medicaid will pay for. What does that mean? Uh, once we have all of this, now remember, you can leave $2,000 or below, I usually say $1,500, into the checking account of the claimant. You can leave that in there for whatever things you need for that for the claimant. So you can leave that in the checking account, but everything above that must go into the Alabama Family Trust, or we call it the AFT for short. And so we do that because we have to get the Medicaid qualified. And while I have the, all this money, they're not qualified. So the first day of the following month, so let's say we deposit all of that money in August. Well, September 1st, they are now Medicaid qualified, which means we can file for Medicaid on their, on their behalf. All the income has been dealt with. It's placed into a QIT. All the extra money has been dealt with. It's placed into the uh, to the Alabama Family Trust. Now, this does not mean that um, you have to sell the house and the car. We're not talking about that. We're talking about liquid assets. Goes into the Alabama Family Trust. And why would we do that? Well, the Alabama Family Trust is a Medicaid payback trust in the state of Alabama, which means that it can the money can be spent on, for the claimant to help on, with things that Medicaid won't pay for. They don't pay for a private room. They don't pay for cable. They don't uh, pay for um, the hairdresser when they get their hair done. They don't pay for uh, odds and ends um, for the claimant. They only pay for room and board and medicines and they pay health care costs. And this is this is just Medicaid, what they pay for. So um, once the claimant gets that money placed into the Alabama Family Trust, that money can be used by the sponsor or Alabama Family Trust calls them representatives. Um, and they can turn in receipts and forms to get things paid for. Alabama Family Trust will pay for a private room differential each month. They will pay for cable. They will pay for hobby supplies if they have hobbies that they do like painting. Um, a lot of people love to do the diamond um, uh, portraits. They'll pay for that. If it's a hobby, they'll pay for it. Uh, they'll also pay for funeral expenses that are not yet paid for. So if you have an, uh, a claimant who does not have pre-need set up, pre-need means pre-burial. They're not dead yet, but you go ahead and you plan everything. Funeral, cemetery, all of that is planned for. Alabama Family Trust, you can pay for that out of the Alabama Family Trust. Um, so the AFT is a great uh, tool for the family to pay for things that Medicaid will not pay for, to increase their quality of care. You can get them recliner. You can get them a new TV for their room. You can get the, you can dress their room up like it's at home uh, with the Alabama Family Trust funds. Now, what happens when that individual dies? Well, we have to look at this. Since that is a Medicaid payback trust, we have to inform the Alabama Family Trust that that claimant has passed away. And when we do this, they immediately freeze the trust, which means nothing else can be paid from it. And at that point, they send an affidavit to Medicaid Montgomery. And they say, how much did you spend on the claimant's behalf? And Medicaid figures up everything they've paid and they send it to the AFT. And the AFT immediately pays Medicaid back for what they've paid. Now, I've had instances 
where we have filed the Alabama Family Trust and the claimant died before the Alabama Family Trust, I mean, before Medicaid was approved. And therefore, Medicaid didn't pay a dime. And they get that affidavit back says Medicaid didn't pay anything. What happens then? Well, you must remember they have been in that nursing home and they've been Medicaid pending. So you owe that nursing home for the claimant. So you could do um, one of two things. Medi um, the AFT will look at who are the beneficiaries or remaindermen is what they call them, but beneficiaries. And they, they're going to send this money to them. But you've got to pay the nursing home. So you can ask the AFT to pay the nursing home directly before they pay the beneficiaries, which is the proper thing to do. So the um, now let's just say this too. Just because they die does not mean that Medicaid won't approve them. Okay. Medicaid will go back and approve. At, if we continue with the Medicaid process, they'll go back and they'll approve back for 90 days. If you have been paying for, if you've been paying their income as you will do each month to the nursing home, then the only thing you'll pay back is their negotiated rate with the nursing home after their approval comes in. Now, a lot of times AFT waits because they know that Medicaid's been applied for and they wait to see if they were approved or not approved. And at that point, if they're approved, they may wait six months to make sure they get that affidavit and then they will pay Medicaid back first and then they will disperse the AFT to the beneficiaries. And that's really the proper thing to do. You never want to leave the nursing home hanging with a bill and not pay them. Uh, no, the family is not responsible for that bill, but the claim it is. And so if you have moved them into a nursing home and built up this bill and um, it is owed, then you need to pay it. And I tell all my clients this, if you have an AFT and they're not approved before the AFT is dispersed, you have um, the moral obligation to pay that bill. So um, I always tell my clients, look, we're going to tell them that the claimant has passed away and we're going to tell Medicaid so they know, but we're also going to tell the AFT to hold that trust until we get the approval from Medicaid so that when they do that and they go back and pay that 90 days, the nursing home will be paid. That's the moral thing to do. And I tell my clients that uh, that's what we do. That's how we handle it. So we want to make sure that nursing home is paid. Now, once all of that's taken care of, the beneficiaries then get a check for whatever's left over in the trust. So if Medicaid paid $62,000 for the claimant and uh, there's a $90,000 trust, they're going to pay back the $62,000 and then they're going to take 10% because they're 501c3 and they have a 10% that they can take. The remainder will then be dispersed to whoever the beneficiaries are. So that's how that works. Why do I use the Alabama Family Trust? Because when I have a husband and wife or I have a single claimant and they are over-resourced, but they've got to have nursing home, that's the way to go. Now, you can spend their money down. You can just write a check each month for $8,000, 10000 whatever it is, the, the room board is. But remember, there's also extras that will need to be paid. Room and board is for that bed in that room only. So if you're paying, if they say your room and board is $8,000, that's the bed and the room. It's not extras. So if they need certain lotions, if they need diapers, all of these types of things, that comes out of pocket. So you may have a bill for $8,000 for the room and for the board, but the extras may be another $1,500. You're talking $9,500 a month. You're paying out of pocket. So it's much easier to set up the AFT and get them set up immediately. So the first day of the next month, your Medicaid pending and we can file. At that point, you only pay the claimant's income um, to the nursing home. And once that is done, um, and if there are any um, uh, insurance, um, like if you have Blue Cross Blue Shield C+, if you have... Um, 
um, Blue RX, you're going to continue to pay that for their life because Medicaid will become the secondary payee and the Blue Cross Blue Shield, whatever you have, will be hit first for the main and then Medicaid will clean up everything else. And so that's the Alabama Family Trust and this is how this works. So if you have any questions, please feel free to, to shoot them to me. Now, how do we handle rental income? Um, rental income is handled just like any other income. Let's say that you have a house and it is getting um, $1,500 a month in rental income. That rental income will need to go into the QIT and pay to the nursing home. Uh, now, let's say that this is a married couple and the rental income is in both their names. She will keep one half of that rental income and in her for her other half goes into the QIT. Now, um, as we've discussed before, um, but I want to go over again, um, there are some married couples whose husband or the claimant, let's say, um, they make all the money and then the spouse or the community spouse makes maybe $600 a month. Well, what do we do with that? Well, Medicaid calculates the difference between the uh, monthly minimum uh, needs allowance of the um, spouse and what um, the uh, income is paid to the nursing home. And they make sure that the um, spouse has enough income. And for 2024, um, that's going to be um, $24.65 per month. So that means that um, she'll get at least twenty four sixty five per month of income, and if if she doesn't make enough, they'll take it from his income. So they they will say, okay, each month you cut yourself a check for eighteen hundred dollars to make sure you have twenty four sixty five in your account. The remainder, after you pay the um, uh, insurance, the medical insurance you pay, goes to the nursing home. So they don't leave the spouse out there hanging, and so. The rental income would be considered like any other income. And if it's 50-50, if that rental lease agreement has both their names on it, or if the house is owned by both of them, the spouse would get 50% and the other 50% goes into the QIT. So that's how a uh, rental income is handled. Now you must have a rental lease. You can't just, you know, it, a lot of people just write a piece of paper, I rent this. No, it must be a bona fide rental lease. It must be executed properly, signed properly by both parties for Medicaid to accept that. The next thing we want to talk about is gifts. Now, this is um, the biggest problem that we have. You'll find, and you've probably heard many times, people have been told, oh, give your, give your home to your child. You don't want your home in your name. That's the biggest issue that we deal with, that... Um, and you cannot do that unless you're on a five-year plan. Remember that this um, Medicaid looks back for 60 months. That's five years. So if this person is ill and they're going to be in the nursing home in the next three to four years, you can't give anything away. This includes the home. Now, if this is a spousal transfer by quick claim deed, that is perfectly legal. Husband and wife can transfer things between each other with no penalty whatsoever. But you cannot deed your home to your child. You cannot deed your home to a trust. You cannot deed your home to anything within the past five years if you're going into a nursing home. If you have a five-year plan and you did it 10 years ago, that's perfectly fine. That is not a problem. They don't go back 10 years. But you got to make sure that when this is done, that deed is recorded properly. The tax notice is being sent to the person who owns the home at this point. They, but if you give them a, an heirship property, if you, if you say that, oh, we're going to give them a life estate in this, you must remember their name is still going to be on the property. And that, that life estate must be paid for properly, which means that you're buying the house 
from the parent at fair market value and the and you must pay that parent fair market value. Now that parent wants to keep a life estate, which means they want to live in that home. Uh, so their name is still going to be on the deed. It's still going to be on the tax assessor's property because they're part owner. And so they look and say, well, how much did you pay them? Did you pay them correctly? You must pay for that life estate. You must pay for the house. It, it's not one you love and affection, $10 love and affection, penalty. You can't do that. Now, a lot of, of, of grandparents pay for tuition for their grandchildren. And that's a wonderful thing, but you can't do it if it's within the past five years and they're going into a nursing home. Why? Because that's considered a gift and it's considered an illegal transfer and you can't do that. Uh, the family would have to pay that back or they'll be penalized for that. Uh, I have this right now going on for children. I've got a grandmother who's been um, paying for the car insurance for the child for the past eight years. Uh, since they were 16 and they're now in college and um, the family's having to pay that back, put that back into the account in one chunk. And so we can show a wash in that. Yes, the grandmother did this. The family has paid it back and there won't be a penalty. So that's very important. Now, let's stop for a second and let's let's talk about gifts that are yearly. Christmas gifts. If, it's, if you show a pattern that this is what they do, they don't buy a gift, they give them money each Christmas, that's fine. You can't do it anymore. But if we show that pattern, they won't be penalized for that. Tithe to a church, perfectly fine. You must stop it once you're on Medicaid, but it's fine all up until then. You can give those tithes, but they stop once they're on Medicaid. You'll also lay fine gifts um, for birthdays. Perfectly fine if you show a pattern, but they must stop once they're on Medicaid. So there are um, there are portions that you can continue to do um, if you show that pattern. Um, but once on Medicaid, you can no longer the 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 um, the spouse can do that from their income. They can continue to do what they want to do with their income. It's their income, but the claimant can no longer be involved in that. I also have, you, you guys have called me before and said, look, I, you know, the, the, uh, I have a, a grandfather who um, is um, widowed and he gave his, his car to his son. Can't do that. Uh, he can sell the car to his son at fair market value. And we get that value from Kelly Blue Book. And we look those up daily for people. And uh, we, what we do, we do a trade-in value and it gives you um, three values. It gives you the least amount a trade-in would, would go for to the most amount. So you've got three different values in there. You've got, um, uh, let's say we do all of our, um, unless it's new, we do all of our conditions as fair, which means they take into account the life of the car, um, the odometer of the car. So if it's got 160,000 miles on it and it's a 2010, it's 2024, you've got 14 years there. That trade-in value is fair uh, because you've been driving that car for that long. I'm sure the seats are worn down some. Uh, the color may be a little um, um, bleached out. I mean, there, there's a lot of issues that can happen to a car that's 14 years old. And so um, we take the less value and we say you must sell it for at least this amount. So the last value I had was for um, an Impala, believe it or not. Um, and that was a 2000, I think it was a 2008 that they had given to their son. The value on, and they had pictures of it. It showed the inside, the outside, and it was very worn. <clears throat> uh, I would have said it would be in poor condition even, but Kelly Blue Book only gives you fair. So I sent them to a dealership to get a fair market value on what a dealer would give you for a trade-in value. We use that. It was on their letterhead and they accepted it. And so we had them sell that car to the child. I think it was like $900, uh, which was very fair for that car. So um, there are ways that you can do that for a lesser value, but 
you have to make sure it is a fair value and that it is something that um, um, is proven. And they may say, they, they have come back to me before and said, give me pictures of the car. If you say it's fair, we want to know, we want the inside and outside pictures. And so we do that. And I've never had one turned down. So just to let you know. Um, Excuse me, Ms. Home. Strickland, we have yes. some questions. Sure. Uh, the first is, what if the rental income is in another state? It's still rental income. It's fine. Okay. Next question. If the parent still owns the home, once admitted to the nursing home, does it have to be sold? Uh, no, <clears throat> excuse me, it does not. Um, on the Medi on every Medicaid application that we do here, there's a box on the Medicaid ap application that says intent to return home. I always check that. First of all, if there's a married couple, she gets to keep the house. So you don't have to sell that. Will there be a lien placed on the house? Yes, it will. Um, so if uh, they place a lien on the house and you have the Alabama Family Trust and you have enough money to pay Medicaid back for the money that they paid on behalf of the beneficiary um, of the claimant, well, then that lien is done away with. They, they don't force that lien. But let's say that uh, it's not. And let's say you owe $30,000 to Medicaid. That lien will remain on that home until that home is sold. Are they gonna come take the home? Absolutely not, they don't want your home. They just want to be paid back. So what happens if the claimant's spouse lives there? She can live there till she dies, not a problem. Once she passes away, um, they're gonna want the house to be sold and they're gonna to want to be paid back for their portion of that money. But let's stop there for a second. What happens if there is a dependent child in that home, which I have right now? Um, and on the Medicaid application, we would tell them there's a dependent child. We have all relevant paperwork for that. And so if that dependent child, if, if, this, if the spouse dies, and that dependent child can stay in that home until he dies or she dies or is placed into a place like the Omega house or somewhere like that where they, they can be taken care of, or they may themselves go into a nursing home. And at that point, the house would be need to be sold and Medicaid paid that. Let's say it's an individual. And let's say that, um, um, and we've had this happen several times. We always check intent to return home. So the a house um, um, doesn't have to be sold right away, but there will be a lien placed on the home. There must be someone to uh, to uh, care for it, which means all upkeep must be done by the family. All bills must be paid by the family. This individual cannot pay for anything for the house. And so the lien will be placed on. And when this individual dies, the house must be sold. And then at that point, pay, Medicaid will be paid back if the AFT did not have enough money to pay it back. If it did at that time, well, then they just remove the lien and then uh, the house can pass by the will. And if there is no will, the family, if the power of attorney can sell that home or they can rent that home, um, that home can even be rented while this person is in the nursing home. And that rental income would go to the um, in the QIT. Um, a portion of it can be um, sectioned off for expenses, you know, when you rent a home, you're gonna have wear and tear. Uh, but that is a, a different story from the, another day. Basically, it's gonna to have to go into the uh, QIT okay. unless it is jointly owned. Okay, next question. What if the patient's home is in her spouse's name only and the spouse is incarcerated? Will that affect the patient? No. Okay. Now let me let me let, let, let me just say this. In the state of Alabama, um, everything is owned by uh, the couple 50-50. Okay. So there is, you know, they would deem if it's just in the name of the spouse, they're still going to deem that as a, a as a couple's home. But they would put a lien against that home for sure. Now, the incarcerated individual, um, it really depends on how long they're going to be incarcerated. When are they coming home? 
who's taking care of the house. If there's no one to do any of that, take care of that or anything, Medicaid sometimes requires that it be sold. Okay. Uh, next question. Example given, colon, if the grandmother has been paying the car insurance for the past eight years, why would the family have to pay it all back? They would have to pay back for the last five years because that's a gift. And if that grandmother's going into the nursing home, that's considered an illegal transfer of funds. Okay. So for the past five years, that would need to be paid back. So just the five years, not the eight years. That's correct. Just the five years. Okay. Next question. How does it work if the home is part of a trust? What type of trust? I need to know that. Okay. Next question. May someone apply for AMA benefits if their home has a reverse mortgage on it or it goes into bankruptcy? Absolutely. We deal with that all the time. Okay. Well, that's the end of the questions thus far. Thank you for those answers. Absolutely. Sure. And if someone would like to email me, you'll have my email on the, on the uh, last slide and give me more details about that trust. I can, I can then give you more detailed answer. Okay. okay. All okay. right. So um, now um, let's look at the, the next thing It's disclaiming title to anything. Now we have to understand that, that disclaiming title to anything is different from selling or giving. Uh, I've had the, um, uh, a couple of clients who have disclaimed their title to mobile homes, who have disclaimed their titles to trailers and to tractors. And what does that mean? That means that they have said, I no longer want this. I'm not going to sell it. It's going to sit here and rot. So the family takes it and they start using it or whatever. Well, first of all, if there is any farm or machinery, we have to know that because we have to put them on the Medicaid application if it's a tractor. And I've got this ongoing right now. And so that tractor has to have a uh, an appraisal done by, um, you know, we, we've had them done by John Deere, several others, Kubota. They'll give you a, a, an actual appraisal on that and it must be sold for that amount or the family can buy it. It cannot just be disclaimed. It's sitting on a property and nobody wants it. It's got, something's got to be done with that. So you can't do that. Let's say there's a trailer. I've had this twice before. Person went into a um, nursing home and they had one acre and they had a trailer on it. And so they just left it to fall apart. You can't do that. Uh, if not for the trailer itself, for the land. So you have to have either sell that um, on a marketplace to get that sold for fair market value or the family can buy it for fair market value. So it's important that we understand that um, you can't just let something rot on a piece of property and Medicaid. Medicaid wants that sold for fair market value. Now, let, I've had this happen. We had a trailer sitting on a back part of a property that a gentleman lived in and was put into a nursing home. He was in his 80s. And it sat back there for years um, because the family were paying for his nursing home care. Well, then all of a sudden, they started, they wanted me to apply for Medicaid. Well, that home still had his title, name on his title, and it's, it's just falling in. We actually had a trailer company, a, a company come out and value that for demolition, for purposes. What could they do with it? And um, it was, a, I think it was a $60,000 trailer, and they valued it at $900 because the walls had fallen in, the car, I mean, it was horrible. And so they wrote a letter, they took pictures, they, I sent off the Medicaid and they accepted that. So when you're dealing with me and you're dealing with Medicaid, I am very blunt, I'm very honest. I'm not gonna hide anything from Medicaid and I'm gonna be very blunt to my client. I'm gonna tell them, this is what you must do before you move forward because it's my name on that application and that client needs help. And if they find out that the family lied about something or didn't tell us something, and Medicaid will find out. They search records. Trust me. Uh, then they come back to me and say, they didn't claim this. I have to go back to the family and say, why didn't you claim this? Well, we didn't think they'd find that. Trust me. They will find it. So uh, I always make sure I go through, a, I have a huge checklist I go through with my clients. And I say, is there anything on a property like an old camper? 
in a uh, mobile home, anything like that, uh, because we must deal with it. So that's disclaimer of something can't be done. Um, selling an item for under the appraised value. Now, that is very common, and we've had this many, many times. Um, I just got an approval in for a person who's in a nursing home. He let a boat sit out under a tree for 10 years. Great boat. And by the time that they sold this boat for $5,000, it was a $60,000 boat, sold it for $5,000. They sold it for under an appraised value by Medicaid. But they did not see what the boat looked like. So we contacted the person who bought the boat, who took pictures before and after because he sells boats and he would like people to see. He sent me all of those pictures and Medicaid approved them and accepted that. But it is rare when you sell something for under an appraised value that someone would take pictures like that. So if you're going to do that, you have to have evidence for why that was done. Appraisals are very important. So you can tell the person who you're speaking with, look, if the home is in really bad shape and it's valued at $200,000 and it's not going to sell but for $110,000, Medicaid is going to want to know why. Appraisals, very important. Pictures are very important. And that's what I tell people. Well, you've already done this, so now you've got a problem. You've got a $90,000 um, problem that's going to be a penalty. Medicaid's not going to approve you until you private pay for that $90,000. Most of the time, that equals out to like um, 10 months of private pay. So if you talk with anyone, always tell them, never, ever sell anything for under appraised value unless you have an appraisal. This is car. This is motorcycle, mobile home, land, house, whatever it is. Appraisals are the key. Um, if you sell it for under an appraised value and you, and, Medica and you don't get an appraisal and Medicaid sees that, you're hit, uh, the person is hit with a huge penalty. Uh, paying for bills for family members. And we have uh, kind of covered that with my grandmother who um, uh, paid for the insurance for her granddaughter. This is the same thing. Um, I've had many times where uh, they've been paying the bills for their loved ones. Uh, they've even helped um, neighbors out. And within 60 months, they can't do that. Um, what happens when that happens is that uh, that must be paid back by the family member or the person they, they paid those bills for. They must pay that back. And a lot of times that's just not, they're just not able to do that. The person who borrowed the money or had them pay those bills for the family member, that is um, uh, because they don't have the money. But that means a big penalty for the claimant and for their family. And lastly, loans to family and friends. Nope, can't do it. Cannot make any loans to family or friends within the past 60 months. Why? Because it's illegal and you'll those would have to be paid back. I just had this happen. Uh, there was uh, a gift actually made to... Um, a son and a daughter, uh, one was 10000 and one was 3000 and they literally paid that back and sent me the deposit slip and um, wrote on the checks, you know, payment back for gift. And and also, you know, when I filed Medicaid, I, I have that evidence that they paid that back. If they hadn't done that, there'd be a $13,000 penalty. Any questions that I can answer? No more questions, just one clarification. The person who asked about the trust doesn't mm -hmm. know um, about it and we'll find out about it and get back with you. That's excellent. You do that and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. And gosh, I got through early and I'm so sorry, Sean. Um, That's fine. I'm sure we maybe can. Maybe I talk too fast. <laughs> well, we've got more questions, so that'll work. Good, good. Uh, what, can you talk about the different trust as it relates to the home? Absolutely. Um, there is something called an irrevocable trust. And this is set up normally by a um, elder law attorney. It's very important that if they're doing Medicaid planning that they see an elder law attorney. And I refer a lot of my elder clients to Bill Nolan 
uh, because he's so good at this and he, he does a great job with planning. So what happens is they will set up an irrevocable trust and they will place the home in an irrevocable trust and they will place all assets into an irrevocable trust. This must be done before the five-year look back. So we're talking if, if you know that 10 years down the road that um, uh, you, you know you're going to need planning, go ahead and get that done. If it was in the five-year look back, there is no planning that can be done except for the Alabama Family Trust, just to let you know that. But if they have it in an irrevocable trust, we don't even have to, we don't even have to, to uh, let Medicaid know about that because that means that all of their assets have been taken out, put into an irrevocable trust that has a trustee. The individual has no control of the money they placed in it. That trustee has control over that. And when is this useful? This is use, useful when you see that your mom may be getting dementia and she's in her 50s. And so you set up an irrevocable trust to have everything placed in there because she's going to be getting worse and worse as years go on. Uh, I saw this with my mother. <clears throat> she had vascular dementia. So um, it started in her 40s and she would just forget very small things. And so uh, we knew by the time she got in her 60s, you know, it would be a um, very difficult situation for her. So a lot of times when you just notice those first little inklings of, of a dementia or Alzheimer's, you got five years to do the planning. Now, sometimes Alzheimer's, you don't have five years, but we knew with mom we did. So uh, we, we, we had that planning in place for her, although we never placed her in a nursing home. But you take all of the assets, you place them into the name of this trust, the trust has an EIN number. It's not. It's not a tax. It's. It's not a um, social security number. It's an EIN number, and um, the tax of uh, the social security number used is of the trustee, not of the claimant. So it's not attached to them, and that trustee is uh, responsible for filing all um, um, tax returns for that and all of that. So what happens to the individual? Well, she can have another bank account, a regular bank account that has money in it. And then the POA can be paying her bills from that account and handling those things from that account. And But that account can never, ever, ever have money deposited into it from the irrevocable trust. Why? Medicaid would see that and see a stream of income and they would go back and attach the irrevocable trust. This has happened before, and we've had to cash in that irrevocable trust had over $270,000 in it, put it to the Alabama Family Trust, because the trustee deposited a check by mistake from that irrevocable trust into the bank account. Medicaid found it. It was four and a half years, unfortunately. And they said, oh, well, since she did this, now that we know, we want that money taken out of the irrevocable trust. And we did. And we put it in the Alabama Family Trust. So never, ever, ever can the money from the irrevocable, irrevocable trust be deposited into the account. You can pay bills for that individual, all of that. But and I get much deeper into this with the claimant, uh, with the family. But th that's how irrevocable trust um, works. Now, there's also a revocable trust. That means that the person's name is still on it. And that just keeps you from doing probate. The house is in the revocable trust. The, the claimant's name, his wife's name, whatever, is on that trust. That just means that you don't need to do probate because it's in a trust and it's going to keep operating in that trust even after he's dead or she's dead. So those are those two trusts. The other trust I talk about a lot is the Alabama Family Trust, which is the Medicaid Trust. Now, so th those are the types of trust. If this individual has an irrevocable trust, we just need a copy. You would need to tell them that whoever they hire need a copy of that trust to look at the date, and they're going to need all bank statements since the inception of that trust for the individual. I don't care if the trust has been there 10 years. I'm going to need 10 years of bank statements because I got to make sure not one check was written into that account. Uh, we go back, well, 60 months, five years. Let's go five years back. And I will look through every single check every single thing to make sure that a check from that trust was not deposited into that account. Because if it was, trust is null and void for Medicaid purposes.
Okay, next question. Any implications for the irrevocable trust being set up in Oregon and we are now in Alabama? No, no, not at all. Irrevocable trust can be anywhere just as long as um, the irrevocable trust does not mix monies with the uh, claimant. Okay. That seems to be the end of our questions, unless someone has another question for Ms. Strickland. We have a few more minutes. Happy to take any questions you have. Um, our CEU, our evaluation link is on the screen, but I'll read it to you one more time. It's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters and numbers b as in boy x c as in cat j six seven q oh and here's a question for you uh oh. Ms. Strickland. is the cost for your services case by case yes it is we, okay. have a, we have a base cost, but we're really charged by the complexity of the case. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Our password today is Medicaid with a capital M, and I've given you the link. Thank you for being with us. Please join us when we return on October 7th with a CEU on supervision in social work. And thank you again, Ms. Strickland, so much yes. for being here today and being here often. We appreciate you. your teachings and trainings, and I know that everyone has felt like they were well served today. Um, if there are no other questions, there's thank yous on the screen, and thank you all for being here. I hope everyone, including you, Ms. Strickland, have a great week. Thank you, and you we'll too. We'll look forward to talking with you all again soon. Have a great day. Thank you.